Hello and welcome to another very special installment of Mini Band Musician. If you haven't already checked out last year's Bandcation video, the link is in the description. 2019 was about New England and more, all in the van. No tents, no hotels, just fun and experiences. This year's plan was a little different, and perhaps God played a role in making it more interesting for you because many of our plans had to be altered on the spot. Without further ado, we'll get into it. This year, due to COVID-related work scheduling, we only had four days to get away, and we were doing so while Danielle was 37 weeks pregnant. This unfortunately struck a few things off of the list that I really hoped that she'd get to do, like horseback riding, but uh, she was happy with the plan. And that initial plan had us camping the entire time. If you're going to visit any part of the Outer Banks of Assateague Island, book your campsites, hotel rooms, or Airbnbs around six months in advance. Our campground was going to be an hour or more from just about anywhere that we were going to visit on the banks because I didn't get to book things until about six weeks leading up to the vacation. Also... And you'll learn why I stress this in just a few minutes. Be aware that weather on the coast there makes it a must that you have a backup plan for just about everything. I mean, I guess that we were there during hurricane season, but hey, we haven't perfected this thing yet. We just do it and talk about it. Anyway, here's the route that we we're taking on our trip. We'd start out with a four-hour drive to Pittsburgh. We'd be visiting Frick Park and its now famous Blue Slide Park again. After that, we'd be going another six hours and some change to Ocean City, Maryland to get in a very highly rated fishing charter. Then we had just a 15 minute drive to our campsite. We'd be sleeping at the Assateague Island campground after grilling up some great stuff. Next day, we'd head to Bells Island campground in Currituck, about a three and a half hour drive. Once we checked in, we'd be heading another about two hours away to the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge to take a kayak tour. From there, we check out both the Elizabethan Gardens and Roanoke Island. We also plan to drive down the banks a bit, probably go out to dinner, sample the locally caught fresh seafood, and crash out back at the campsite. On day three, we're going to make that drive to the OBX again, this time to Kerala, to go on a wild horse tour, to see the horses walking freely along the beaches. We travel further down the banks to Cape Hatteras Seashore and go swimming and see what else was great to take in down there. Once again, we drive back to Currituck and stay the night and only have a few hours to explore any more of the area the following day. We had a 12 and a half hour drive home. We'd probably go swimming for a little while and I'd surf fish. I don't remember the tail end of those plans because all of our plans got shattered. But this was a rare time in life in which you pick up the pieces, reassemble the glass, and the view is possibly better. That was a lame metaphor, but I digress. It had rained much of the night and early morning, so the cardboard boxes at Blue Slide Park are pretty much useless. The slide itself was still a little damp, but we thought about it beforehand and brought our own boxes. The slide wasn't as slick, it would be in better weather, but it was still fun. We'd also left ourselves plenty of time to explore the park, or so we thought, and take on some of the trails. You almost need an entire weekend for all of Frick Park. Sure, we'd appreciated the 644 acres the last time that we visited, but the twisting and turning trails that we'd chosen to take ate up some clock. It's a beautiful place and we encountered some animals while we were there. I'm still blown away that there's such wildlife in the middle of a major city. Micah found some toys while we were there too, so that's a plus. New toys for a kid who may become quite bored in the backseat of a long trip. After a couple of hours at Frick Park, it was time to hit the road again, en route to Ocean City, Maryland. We had a six hour drive to our charter fishing boat, Miss Ocean City, and about seven hours to do it in. That meant we had to locate a place to eat and do so quickly. Prior to the trip, we'd search for breakfast restaurants within a half an hour of Frick Park, and we'd come up with a lot of trendy, hipster types of places. Those results only served to make us yearn for a country-style, more laid-back place even more. So I expanded my search to include places within 45 minutes, and I found South Greensburg Restaurant. And somehow, it only added 20 minutes to our trip. The place was great. I highly recommend it if you're ever making a trip to Pittsburgh or anywhere along 76. The place was home with a giant pancake, and those enormous pancakes and burger-style sausage patties ended up being the following day's breakfast too, basically. We actually got our first glimpses of horses on the beaches prior to camping at Assateague or touring Kerala. While the fishing was slow due to weather, come to find out, that definitely perked things up. Eventually, I caught an Atlantic croaker, a fish that makes a sound somewhere between a croak and a purr, one that I catch five more of later. Got to hang out with a horseshoe crab that was caught, and it crawled over Danielle's foot, and saw a few other cool catches that others got. 
The guys on the charter couldn't have been nicer, and the captain even allowed Micah to sit in the captain's chair and steer a bit near the end of the trip. I put a link to Miss Ocean City in the description. That tour is definitely minivan musician approved. Another place that we highly recommend is a Full Moon Saloon. There weren't many places open nearby for a bite to eat late in the evening on a Sunday. The mate on the boat told us to check the place out, and it was really great. My first taste of fresh soft crab, and it definitely wouldn't be my last, not even on this trip. With our stomachs full but very worn out from the road, we were headed to our campsite at Assateague State Park. The only problem? It looked as though we were going to get there after the park was closed. It had sounded like we'd be okay if that happened, though, so without any other choice anyway, we sped the final 20 minutes of our day's driving and ran smack dab into the kind of experience that only the people at Minivan Musician could. I'll let Danielle talk about that Assateague National Park, its campground, and the horses. So when we got to Assateague Park, it was already closed for the night. So luckily we had this um, pin number to punch in at the gate. And it took us a while to actually find that and the entrance because it was so dark. So here we are driving around in this big circle looking. And Astatigue is famous for its wild horses. Like, these are actual wild horses, though, not like horses that live in a farm and, you know, are pets and whatnot. So there's signs everywhere that warn you not to approach them because they may charge or bite um, and not to feed them and all this stuff. So we're driving around looking for this entrance and we pull up on a whole herd of horses on the side of the road in the dark. Like imagine if you're in Michigan, like you see a whole bunch of deer, you know, that's pretty normal here. Well, it's normal to see a whole bunch of horses on the side of the road there. Um, so yeah, we're like super excited because this is something completely new and different for us. So we park and get out to take pictures. Well, I start, you know, coming to my senses like, okay, you know, maybe we probably shouldn't get up like super close to them. Um, so I decide we better, you know, get back in the van. And one of the horses started like marching toward us like really fast, um, and it was, it was a pretty large mare, a female, and there was a really young colt with them, too, so I was assuming she must have been the mom, and she walked right up on the van. I mean, we were in the van, got in the van, shut the doors, rolled the windows up, the whole nine, and her head was right on the hood, like, sniffing around. If you picture, like, those safaris where, you know, the giraffes, like, stick their heads in your windows and stuff, except this is a horse... And this was a pissed off horse. She was a little bit mad that we were um, we were there. So, so we kept uh, the windows rolled up, and she just walked around the van, like just the whole van, for a few minutes, along with a few of the other horses. And there were like ten of them along the road. So uh, Mike rolled down the window at one point, threw an apple out there, and the pissed off one kind of went and took a few bites. And then she just, like, passed it to the other horse. And we slowly pulled out of there. Uh, and it was our first ever encounter with wild horses. And it was scary as shit. <laughs> and incredibly amazing at the same time. I, I mean, I've never experienced anything like that. It was, it was incredible. Uh, I was, like, in shock that it happened. Um... But we were so exhausted when we did find the campsite, we decided just to sleep in the van. I mean, it was super windy and dark, and there was, you know, a tropical storm supposedly coming in that was messing up all of our plans and stuff. So we're like, you know what? Fuck it. We're not putting the tent up. So the next morning, uh, we woke up to two horses just casually walking through our campsite, eating grass, just chilling. I mean, they got so close to us. The one was just, I mean, right, I could have touched him, but, you know, you really you really shouldn't try to reach for him, so we didn't, you know, we still couldn't approach them. Uh, and it's really hard not to because you just want to go pet them so bad. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was it was amazing to see the horses, like, just walking around right up 
by your car and just right by your picnic table and just like it was nothing. Uh, and the campground itself was great. I mean, really great. It's definitely somewhere that we're going to return to. Uh, it was beautiful. I mean, the ocean is right there. Beautiful beach. Micah loved playing in the waves. Um, so we'll be returning for sure. It was pretty amazing place. As for our day one totals, we had 660 miles driven, which is about $76 in gas, and 318 total dollars spent. Uh, the fishing charter was about 120 with uh, renting the poles and a bait and a tip. Uh, we spent $24 only, I believe, to camp at Assateague, and we spent 98 bucks between two restaurants. Now, this is where problems would arise from many different sources. The first of which was me having to find, pay for, and take a urinalysis test for my probationary obligations. It's so rare that I get called in for a test, but of course my random color got called when I was not only out of town, but when we are on a tight schedule. Now, adding to that, we had heard a few things about a possible incoming storm the night before, and we'd known a week or so in advance that something may have been coming during the time that we were on vacation. But after the girl at the park's front desk had told me that the park would be closing that day and not reopening the following day, we started looking more into the incoming storm, and we found out that many sources were considering it to be an incoming hurricane. The guy at the Assateague Market, link in the comments, they have a lot of fishing stuff and reasonably priced souvenirs, seemed very been there, done that about it, and said that it was a basic nor'easter, which I wasn't familiar with until this trip, and that it would blow over. However, he warned that our pre-booked activities, kayak tour, horse tour, and even our campground, would likely be closed or canceled. Add that to the fact that the urine test was going to cost him us $200 and take up more than two hours of our time, and it made for what was working itself towards being a terrible day. While waiting for people to take useless COVID tests, seriously abusing the system out of paranoia, to take my overpriced urine test, I found out that our campground would be closed. Great, right? Even booking around six weeks in advance, there hadn't been any campsites open anywhere within an hour of the Outer Banks. The few hotels I looked into while planning a trip were all booked far in advance as well. It was sounding like our trip was going to come to an end just as it got going. Well, Outer Banks Kayak Tours offered to do a Wednesday night sunset tour in Nags Head as a rescheduled date. That would mean that I'd need an extra day off of work, but that could probably be worked out. So we'd need a hotel room for Monday night and Tuesday night, and we'd be able to explore the OBX a little more. It's just that the stuff on Roanoke Island would likely be canceled as well. No matter, I kind of like the idea of exploring on our own. I just had to find a hotel. I did some intensive Google searching, reading reviews, stuff like that. I managed to find a Traveler's Inn in Elizabeth City. The price was reasonable, and they had one opening for two nights that we needed. The hotel experience was terrible, and I won't waste the time in the details, but I've left a link to my review of that establishment in the description. We'll just leave it at cockroach, broken stuff, and fake refund. The location was pretty cool. Elizabeth City is around 45 minutes of what I'll call inland of Kitty Hawk in the Outer Banks. It's a medium-sized town with a small-town feel. It's the county seat of Pasquotank County, so it obviously features some fishing areas on the Pasquotank River. It ended up being a laid back and nice place to call home for a couple of days, a quiet break from the stresses of rescheduling, and a literal safe harbor from the storm. We're being more and more convinced by the media that the storm is going to be one for the ages. Turns out it wasn't. Go figure. One thing we got to do while we were running back and forth between places that Danielle wanted to do was visit a Wawa. I knew nothing about Wawa from working uh, with people that set up stages and all of that across the country. Danielle knew it really well. Um, it's more sandwich shop than it is convenience store. And the sandwiches are amazing. I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. I mean, the line was crazy, but I mean, you know, people was grabbing stuff before the storm and everything. But man, I highly recommend Wawa. I believe they're only on the East Coast. But uh, you might want to look it up and check that out on their website. Now, as far as day two totals, we spent $93, I believe, on food, uh, a couple of little souvenirs, drinks, ice, uh, $95 on hotel. We drove 200 miles. That's about $23 in gas. So total, we spent $216. Now, day three. Elizabeth City really was a beautiful place to sightsee. It's great for fishing and there's a lot of history that comes with it. 
On that day, we did visit the town's waterfront park and Charles Creek Park. Both were great. I didn't catch anything, but we were really just unwinding and seeing what these places had to offer. Charles Creek Park had a play structure for kids. It was closed due to COVID, but it wasn't closed for Micah. Now, in Elizabeth City, we had to stop at Poor Boys Farmer's Market. It was a place that operated on the honor system, and I'll say, if you ever visit, please pay for what you get, because these guys offer some great stuff. It has all of the fruits and vegetables that you'd expect, and they're better than what you're likely used to, but it's also got freshly caught frozen crab. They got some of the best steaks I've ever grilled and all sorts of meats and just about anything that you could imagine. After a quick trip to put stuff in our cooler for later, we headed to Kerala for our wild horse tour. Backcountry Safari Tours does a great job with their horse tour. Well worth the money. Our guide, Safari Steve, was ridiculously knowledgeable about the area. He was really friendly. He knew a lot about the horses, too. At first, we didn't see many horses, aside from the one we got very close to on the beach immediately due to the weather. However, toward the end, Steve made sure that he tracked several down, and it was an amazing experience to see the horses not only freely roaming, but doing so in the back and front yards of homes. Corrala and Assateague are the only places that you can see wild horses in the United States. I'll put a link to Backcountry Safari Tours in the description. Make a reservation if you're heading to Corrala. We caught a glimpse of the Currituck Lighthouse, but it was extra crowded and we were starving, so we'll save climbing it for the December-January trip this year. We grabbed a quick bite at Fat Crab's Rib Company, and once again I had a soft crab and it was nearly as good as the one at Full Moon Saloon back in Ocean City. Next, we're going to explore the Outer Banks and check out a beach or two. One of the first things that you notice about several towns going down the banks is the fact that they have many of the same stores and shops in the same order as the town before them. Kitty Hawk, Kill Devil Hills, Nags Head, and probably a few that I'm forgetting all have a Sugar Kingdom, Super Wings, and I believe Sensations and a few others. It's really quite interesting that the main strip is mirrored in that way. Anyway, I promised Micah that we'd check out Sugar Kingdom. If you don't know what it is, it's a candy store that looks like a palace, and it's a tourist trap of all traps for parents. I will admit that it's pretty cool, and we'll talk about it later. We first visited the beach in Kitty Hawk. Now, all beaches in North Carolina and South Carolina are public, so you park a block or two away and just go down there. Due to the tropical storm, we were only able to kind of literally get our feet wet and wait a bit. There are lifeguards and flags everywhere letting you know. But the beaches are gorgeous, the water is warm, and surf fishing is about as cool as it gets. I caught a couple more Atlantic croakers, something that was becoming a theme and that would continue. And despite learning the hard way about how the tide comes in higher and higher, I had to buy a new vaporizer. Having so much space on the beach, fishing with chunks of whole squid as bait, and just the relaxation that comes with the beautiful and crashing waves was a really cool experience. We decided to take a drive down Croatan Highway toward Cape Hatteras. Now, I knew that the OBX was a long strip of all beach, but wow, we didn't make it all the way to Cape Hatteras. Nope. We stopped our trek somewhere around Salvo, and that had been around an hour's drive. Seeing that area in the evening, though, is something to behold. There's a certain power to the bridges, the dunes, the water on either side of you, and the vastness that I can't really describe. On our next trip, we're visiting a, a few of the many reserves and refuges. They're literally right there. But it was night and we were really just exploring. I wanted to make it to Buxton because the fishing is supposed to be the best down there, but that would have been another half hour or more. After getting to know the OBX and its layout a bit, we headed back toward the hotel. It was a long drive and we wanted to grill and chill. We did just that and I'm serious when I say that the steaks were among the best I've ever had. The vegetables were right up there with them and even the drinks that we got from that stand were ridiculously good. The cockroach thing happened after eating. It happened after issues with the TV, the toilet, the internet, the fridge, and whatever else. I don't even remember. We don't do cockroaches. I understand that some people can tolerate that and that it's to be expected of many when you journey down south, but nope, not for us. We slept in the Grand Caravan. This one was turning out to be a vacation for real. Now, our day three totals, we spent about 100 bucks on food, but some of that did come home with us. We spent $137 at the horse tour. And we drove about 220 miles, which is 26 bucks in gas, so we spent $323. Day 4. Waking up sore and quite tired, we set out the next day to stop a few places that hadn't been available to us the day before. I grabbed a coffee at Muddy Waters in Elizabeth City, linked to, pretty damn good coffee, and we are on our way. 
I took Mike and to one of the several Sugar Kingdom locations. There are multi-tiered tables that are separated by candy type, gummies, taffy, gums, chocolate, so on and so forth, and there's probably at least a dozen of them. There are also chocolate eggs that are more for adults and several types of fudge. They charge for the candy by the weight. Somehow I spent almost $60. I'll admit that it was cool to be able to get anything in this place and that we got a lot of candy, but be warned, it can cost you a lot. Danielle wasn't feeling the greatest, so it looked like Micah and I were going into the Elizabethan Gardens alone. It's a historical site that I can't begin to explain. I believe I have some photos here to do the talking for me, and I highly recommend checking it out. It opens right up to the sound as well if you travel all the way to the back once you're in there. It's located right next to the historical Fort Rowley and is one heck of a nice park. I would have loved to explore Roanoke Island due to the Lost Colony and all that cool stuff that comes with that, but the renowned nightly theater presentation, the museums, the aquarium, and many other things are closed due to COVID. Roanoke Island is a must return though. Shortly after visiting Elizabethan Gardens, Right before we were due to go on our Sunset Kayak Tour, our pet rat Gus Gus passed away. Taking the advice of so-called experts online, we brought he and his brother Felix on a trip with us. We always kept the air conditioning blasting, paid attention to them whenever possible, and did everything right, but the stress of the trip must have taken him. Needless to say, we are very sad. I take responsibility for it, but the reason I bring this up is to state that the sunset in Nags Head is unbelievably beautiful. It was enough to distract us from such a sad happening, at least in the moment. I'll let Danielle tell the rest about the tour and the sunset itself. Uh, the Outer Banks Kayak Adventure Tour. We were supposed to uh, do the Alligator River Tour, but it got canceled. They ended up rescheduling to the Sunset Tour in Nags Head uh, because of the tropical storm. It turned out actually to be super, super nice. It was really relaxing. I was so tired and in so much pain being super, super pregnant at the time. So I was really nervous to even go in the first place. And our guide, uh, Connor... He was super laid back, really nice. Um, turns out he was actually from Ohio, <laughs> had a brother in the NFL. Uh, we got to have Micah in the kayak with us, so all three of us got to ride together, which was nice. Um, and it was just really peaceful, relaxing. The sky was gorgeous. That was my first time ever in a kayak on the ocean. Uh, that was incredible. It was less scary than I thought it would be. Um, and it was definitely worth the money, and I'm really glad that we went, and I would absolutely recommend that company for sure, and we will be returning doing the Alligator River one finally when we go back. A place we found to get a late night bite was Snowbird Burgers and Cones. Now that's a place where the name is kind of self-explanatory, but they also have shrimp and stuff like that. It's kind of a stand that you walk up to. I mean, it's really popular in the area, and it's really good, reasonably priced. The reason we ended up there is because we were out a little bit further, and we were looking up restaurants online, asking for people's input on it and stuff around there. And um, two or three places that we tried first were closed. Or the kitchen was closed at the places that doubled as a bar. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because if you go on vacation to OBX like during COVID or whatever, or matter of fact, vacation anywhere, double check the hours by calling. Now, something that I got to do that I'll always remember before we hit the road and went home was I got the night fish. Uh, I did it by surf fishing again. There's a pier there, but I opted for just doing it the way I wanted to do it. I walked down next to the pier at Nags Head and was fishing right there in the water. Um, it's just amazing. You look out and it feels like a million miles of complete and utter darkness. There's almost no light on the beach as well. So you got to take a flashlight down there and stuff. It was funny. There was a bunch of kids. It seemed like I think they might have left their prom or something that, that were out there partying. Um, you know, the little bar that's attached to the pier up there was kind of lively too, but man, it was almost quiet when you, when you get out there. And even if it wasn't, the waves cover everything up. I mean, it's almost scary to these powerful waves. Every now and then you see, you know, some kind of fish or something jump out of the water. I mean, we're finding pieces of jellyfish. 
there's probably a million little holes with uh, those little crabs coming up out of them, you know, walking sideways up and down the beach. Uh, Micah was creeped out by them, you know, basically said they look like gigantic spiders, but, you know, they're friendly and they're funny to watch and stuff like that. They don't, they don't want to come anywhere near you anyway. But um, it was a really cool experience to fish there. Uh, I caught, I think, three more of those Atlantic croakers. Another thing that I'll tell people before they go there, now most people will be renting uh, fishing rods when they're there because they'll be doing it off the piers, but um, just make sure that your fishing rod is one that's made for salt water. Now, the one that I bought there for her was, mine was so similar I didn't even check it, but yeah, I destroyed a fishing reel while I was fishing the Outer Banks. I must say that the drive home was brutal. I know, I know. We stated in the last vacation video that we break the driving up more in order to make the trip more pleasurable. But because of COVID shortening the time that we had, we originally planned this out as an eight-day trip. We worked with what we had, a constant theme with your friends at Minivan Musician. I opted for a different drive home. Rather than the 76 way, which took us back through the hilly regions of Pennsylvania, we opted for the 64 way, essentially, and perhaps it was my exhausted mind at the time, but I was reminded that West Virginia is pretty damn hilly too. There was probably a little bit of a break from the inclines, except where they have special roll-off lanes for semis that lose control around turns, I'd never seen those before. And I think that there are some better views, but all in all, it's about the same. Over 13 hours of driving and we were home. We actually took an entire day to recharge before I returned to work. And I must say that despite the last driving part, losing an adored family pet, and cramming everything into such a short trip, we really enjoyed ourselves. As a matter of fact, we enjoyed ourselves so much that we're doing a New Year's trip with my other two sons and a new baby here in a few months. From December 29th to January 2nd, we're doing an Airbnb for a couple of nights, and we got nearly every detail planned out. I'm sure it'll go wrong, and that's where it goes right for you. So our totals for the entire trip were around 2,100 miles driving, and we spent about $1,250. Now that's pretty decent considering the fact that we ended up spending about $150 more due to hotels, and due to the hotel having, you know, a messed up refrigerator and us not being able to keep our food and stuff like that the way that we'd like to, we probably spent an extra hundred or so on food, too. So, you know, for about a thousand bucks, you can have a four day vacation in the Outer Banks and it can be very enjoyable. Just make sure you check the weather. In closing, I urge everyone to take a trip to the Outer Banks at some point. Plan the best you can around any possible weather issues and just have a couple of backup plans for the hopefully unlikely situation in which you have to cancel an activity or a particular leg of the trip. I hope that uh, you can take some tips and recommendations from us based on the places that we went um, and the services and, and the companies that we used and the restaurants. Um, this upcoming trip includes the Boardwalk and Duck, Duck Donuts, Pea Island Refuge, Fishing at Jeanette's Pier, and a lot more. What we can speak on now is Ocean City is gorgeous. And we'd urge you guys to check out Jolly Roger Amusement Park there. We didn't get to because of the weather, but we got really cool views of it while we were out in the fishing charter. It's right next to it. But surely check out the fishing charter that we link to in the description. Live at the Assateague State Park. If you can't do that, camp there for as long as you can. And book it six month, months in advance. Do pass through Elizabeth City if you're looking for a chill place to pass a day. Do surf fish, but also check out the many piers that they have that are renowned for getting even beginners very large ocean fish. And Jeanette's is open in the winter. Uh, it's a nags head, so we'll be going there. Go further down the banks than we did. We're doing that this next time around. Take in a sunset kayak trip for sure and do a wild horse tour. There's links to many of these places in the description, and we wish you safe travels and a good trip to all. Let us know your experiences and trip ideas in the comments. If there's anything that we can be of help with, please let us know. Don't forget to subscribe and tap that bell, and as always, thank you very much for watching.